So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Margo Collins. I'm a teaching fellow here at the law school. And this panel is Food, Health, and Whiteness is Property. I'm very excited to hear what all of these folks have to say. We're going to start with Ernesto Hernandez Lopez. And Ernesto is a professor of law <coughs> at the Daly Fowler School of Law at Chapman University. And he writes about intersections of race and food and municipal land use, and we'll characterize that correctly. And his presentation today will be, is called The Banning Sri Rasha, Municipal Authority and Racial Exclusion as Property. We'll turn it over to Ernesto. I'm sorry, how long do we have? 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, Sophia will get, okay. hold up some notices yeah, when you're running out of time. Do we have one? Yeah. And we lost the panel. Yeah. But I'm still keeping my notes. Okay. <laughs> for showing up. This is a new project of mine, and um, I'm looking for a way to possibly convert it into a law review article. I've submitted it to a food studies journal, but um, my plan is to present the doctrine and the politics first, and then move on to the critical aspects, which would be both um, critical geography and, and I would argue also a, a vital element of race. And so my, my topic of discussion was a very hot topic in the news up until May of this year, which was when they tried in, in a locality close to um, Los Angeles in, in suburban um, San Gabriel Valley of Irwindale to stop the production of a hot sauce that actually had a great deal of public following and it became a big debate amongst foodies amongst people who like the hot sauce that tends to have a following that's very hipster, very foodie, also very multicultural. And then um, it, it just bogged down into like a bigger dispute and, and, and towards the end of the dispute when it ended in May, it took on proportions of like California versus the rest of the United States and the Republican Party looking for people who aren't necessarily Anglo and, and, and white voting for um, the Republican Party. So. Um, I argue here that there's two important points. One, um, which is a constant type of discussion that I'm having in my research, is that food um, represents larger political and legal contests. Um, whenever we see contests about food, whether it's subsidies, whether it's the Ag Bill, whether it's you can eat foie gras, you can eat shark fin soup, I say that these imply larger contests. And so when we look at an issue about food that's usually in the news, something bigger is at stake. Um, the, the second idea I, I posit here is that given where this food was being produced and what was the governmental entity that ultimately had to approve of it, um, provides a very powerful lens into local law and what I would argue is possibly some type of vestige of, of some race-based privilege. And so if we look and see which is the city where this happened and then the larger contest that were at play, a great deal comes up. And so, so let me just explain a little bit for those people who don't know what this hot sauce is. It's um, a very popular hot sauce made by an individual and his family named David Tran. And essentially it's a very artisanal recipe that basically requires the freshest, most select jalapeno peppers that need to be ground within two hours. They need to be ground within two hours because or else they will, um, be, uh, they will ferment. And so the idea is that this is you know, an artisan local product with chili peppers sourced from Ventura County <coughs> from only one farm that specializes in this. And then it's relocated in this mass um, migration of chili peppers, which is going on at the moment, basically from September to November when it's ground. And so the company is called Hui Fong, and um, it was originally crafted in 1980 for the Vietnamese soup pho, which in, in, in southern Vietnam, they tend to you know, eat it a lot more spicy. And so David Tran came to the United States as a refugee. He's of Chinese descent, started making the sauce. And it, it basically was a very, very you know, popular hot sauce that um, had like a cult following. It had a cult following amongst non-Asian like food markets or non-Asian communities because it represented like this thing that everyone liked 
It didn't have any advertising. It had like this, you know, the, this image of the rooster. Um, it had the name Hui Fang. He put on the bottle in like three different languages this explanations about it. But it was basically a very secretive, no advertising type of company that gained this huge following because of the high quality and because of its, it, uh, of its market appeal. The numbers are astounding. It's make the, they claim that it makes $65 million a year, 20% um, sales, um, increase for the past 10 years, and they expect that for the next couple of years, 12,000 bottles are made an hour. And this all happened in Irwindale, where um, in 2012, they relocated into a new factory. And so the new factory was relocated into 2012. It was $40 million that cost this new factory, 655,000 um, square feet. It was a great deal of redevelopment money into this community that was invested into this, um, into this new plant of Hoi Fong, um, Hoi Fong um, um, foods, which makes three products. The most popular is Sriracha, but the other products that are quite well known are um, sambal, sambal olek, um, garlic chili, um, and, and, and basically what happened was um, in October of 2013, last year, the local residents, um, some local residents were complaining that these chili peppers were being ground and it was a public nuisance and that these smells were offensive, that they were irritating symptoms, that they were aggressive and spicy, and basically the city and the hot sauce company, Hui Fong, could not come to an agreement. They could not come to an agreement, and basically in October uh, um, 28, 2013, they went for a temporary restraining order. Then they went for a, 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 a preliminary injunction, and you know that that stopped in November. But there was a, a trial that was set for this year. So at one point, what happens is uh, a judge issues an order saying stop producing what smells. But I think. There's no credible evidence of all the harmful impacts that the city is citing. So the city provides these complaints, and you know this is a city of only 1,500 people. But in court papers, they say 11 people are complaining. The city council, when it declares all these resolutions that name it to be a public nuisance, only 30 people um, are approximately complaining. And then the 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 South Coast Air Quality Management District finds it's only 61 people are complaining to them. Only four of these are ever traced to the hot sauce, and they mostly come from four houses. So, you know, there was a lot of, you know, what one can see here, and in my research, I find this quite difficult for myself because, you know, this is mostly a Latino community, so I find myself taking what would be seen as an anti-Latino um, stance, maybe, and on top of that, this is a company that's being seen as, a, as contaminating, so, you know, I'm siding with the company when I'm pro Sriracha. Um, you know, in, in the, the local residents are complaining about the smell. And so there was this huge push, basically, um, other than a couple of local residents and city hall members, city council hall members, basically saying that this was, a, this was unfair. It was maybe, you know, no one was really using the word discriminatory, but definitely it was hostile and aggressive. So in May of 2014, the city um, and Hui Fong agree after a great deal of attention. It's undisclosed why they agree. Uh, but basically, this would have turned into a situation where the experts from the city would have complained and the experts from the hot sauce company would have talked about um, what the actual smell is about. Meanwhile, all types of politicians from all over California are um, arguing this should not, they, they should not close down the factory. They should not, you know, this is an example of California um, being anti-business. And, and if you see this, why city council members or even the city, you know, they're acting in their interest. This is, you know, we, we could see this as civil society or people resisting against a, public, a, a privately held corporation that's going to be committed to producing hot sauce and in their eyes um, contaminate and make things very difficult. And so the, the idea why this became such a hot topic was because it was all over the news. It was unbelievable to see the news and, you know, I, I could basically read in Spanish and in English and newspapers in Europe, but there was also a great deal of news in Asia. And so it became a debate amongst hot sauce lovers and like, you know, uh, Vietnamese food and Asian food and, and chefs. And all of a sudden it was in The Guardian, it was in The New York Times, you know, it was, it was all over the place and it quickly fed into larger debates. The debates that, you know, when, when there was all this resistance and all this discussion that the city was being hostile and aggressive, it became a debate about California jobs, California being anti-business, 
Um, Ted Cruz w w was tweeting about it. Um, the governor was very worried about it. And, and the story here is, is cast within a, a typical s scenario that, you know, this is a poor um, um, refugee who came to the United States in 1980, rags to riches. Um, you know, it, it fits in the discourse, if, if you know about Vietnamese politics, of, you know, um, business and government being, um, you know, being seen as over-regulatory. And so this quickly became an issue for the Republican Party to see this is a way to court in California voters who aren't necessarily Anglo, but we could, you know, speak about hot sauce, speak about small business. So what is my context that to make sense of is where this context happened, where the conflict and the dispute occurs is extremely important. It's in a city called Irwindale. Irwindale only has 1,400 residents, and it's referred to in Spanish as Armada Jardín de Roca, which means the rock garden. And, you know, my argument here is that this is an example of space not being neutral. This is an example of locations not automatically having some type of civil rights or some type of um, um, uh, hegemony or oppression. Instead, you know, forces, whether they're political, forces, whether they're material or ideological, craft this space to be, I would say, privileged. And so here, we have a very unique scenario. It's in the San Gabriel Valley. It's 90% Latino. It was incorporated in 1957. And it's only had, at, at least as of 2007, only one non-Latino on its city council. And the, the, the situation of this city is it's very unique because it was incorporated in 1957 with the help of Latham Watkins because this is a city where a great deal of mining occurs. The majority, 50% of the aggregate and gravel in California roads comes from this city. And so in 1957, um, corporate interest motivated the Latinos who were living there and have been living there since the 1840s or maybe a bit after that to incorporate a city. So essentially, when, you, when they would incorporate this area, which had been known as Sonora Town, but now it became called Irwindale, could avoid taxes would have a loyal voter base that was residents, and they could avoid county taxes and county regulation. So if we see this from a very typical California perspective, this is an example of a single industrial use city, similar to Vernon, similar to Bell, similar to City of Commerce, similar to City of Industry, which are always in the news. But the weird thing about this one is residents actually live there. And in those cities, we don't have so many residents, but here we have a unique scenario where it's 90% Latino population, Anytime you hear the, you read the history of the news about the politics of Irwindale, it comes down to three or four or five families who have been there forever. And so, um, you know, if you see what's going on politically, um, you know the, the 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 city had to exert its influence over the company. Um, most elections come down to only one or two votes, and there's often a recall. So when when the politics gets so entrenched and so you know insular or such about small issues. They basically, you could see why either they, they, they wanted to exert their influence over the city, I mean, over the company, or they had these, you know, public interests that they had to necessarily um, exert. So the, the argument here is that you have residents that were incorporated into a state in 1957 to avoid taxes, to have a loyal, to have a local loyal base. But the perspective is that they control sovereign power, sovereign powers of police, sovereign powers of of of. of of a city attorney, and this has led to crazy types of politics. If you look at the politics of Irwindale, you even have you know city councilmen spiking enchiladas with quaaludes. To to you have big issues about the city um, having a great deal of corruption trials. And so, the way I make sense of this is to look at the history. Look at the history of San Gabriel Valley. And here I follow a couple of um, cultural studies and, and and historians who look at this from a critical lens. This is a, an area that traditionally had been on the east side, um, it had been uh, citrus groves. And citrus groves were very much controlled by um, Anglo corporate interests, and the housing and the labor was divided into Asian and Latino. While on the west side, we have Chinatown and we have East LA. And, and so the argument is that that sets up um, a, a concept where the, the, the cities are structured in a certain way, the landowners or the people who own houses um, set up these small little communities that become different with industrialization, with post-industrialization, with highways. And so when we see in this area right now where it's, you know, it's some of the most heavily populated, mostly 
either Latino or mixture of Asian and Latino, but this is all a remnant from the history that I talk about, whether it's citrus groves, whether it's rock um, gravel mining, and so this um, space where local authority is exercised is actually deeply committed and deeply an expression of, I would say, privilege and, um, and, 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 and power. And so, you know, when we think of Saracha, I would say it's the city is exerting its power, its privilege over sovereignty of a local city, but the whole perspective is that um, this has been um, morphed. It was initially Latinos as a loyal constituent and as um, a voter group. Here it sees lo uh, Latinos holding on to city council, but this is extremely important because suburbs are increasingly where non-white people, immigrants, Asian communities live. And so when we think about you know, whiteness as property or privilege of government ownership, we should be thinking about suburbs and where you know, future communities that aren't Anglo will be living. So I'll just leave it at that, but I look forward to any discussion you have and questions because I'm trying to convert this into a law review article, but the essence is food is an important issue of contest, but here space is often inherited with extremely important racial connotations, but thank you. She writes about intersections of critical race studies and food, and we'll be talking about uh, food oppression, um, whiteness as whiteness property, and food oppression. I spilled it. So I'm going to clear that for you. <laughs> this is the closest thing I have to a sponge. Oh, I have that.
ranking of obesity. Also within the United States, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, and other groups experience greater health problems than whites. Many factors contribute to these disparities, including access to care, racial bias in treatment, environmental harms that are prevalent in segregated neighborhoods, mass incarceration, medical research priorities, and correlation with poverty. So if we look at food-related conditions, we'll see these pronounced racial disparities, heart disease, cancer, death from cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure. Okay, in every category, you'll see these racial disparities. And a new study shows that the health disparities between rich and poor and between whites and non-white racialized groups is actually increasing. Poor health, health outcomes in this country and these health disparities result from policy choices that come out of the collaborations between government and the food industry. And the harmful impact of these relationships falls heaviest on those with the least political leverage. That's what food oppression is. So the food company's influence comes from the relationships that are facilitated by political donations, well-funded lobbying, and a revolving door between the industry and the government. And these are just a few examples. Some examples of the harmful policies that result are the finding by the USDA that pizza is a vegetable. Okay, this was a, quite a controversy. <coughs> and I have some comics, cartoons here that uh, show people's frustration with this decision. Tomato sauce, of course, tomato is actually a fruit, so it really shouldn't be classified as a vegetable. But this decision, which allowed pizza companies to stay in the school lunchrooms, particularly affects lower income kids who are the ones who have to eat the school lunches you know, and can't afford to bring lunches from home. And it's particularly important as well for young people who develop taste when they're, when they're little and usually keep these preferences when they get older. So Pizza Hut now serving vegetables. Another example, and one that I've written about, is the USDA partnership with fast food companies that resulted from a surplus of milk high fat milk specifically, that resulted from the dietary guidelines warning against milk to consumers because of the terrible effects that it has on health. The government was compelled to purchase this surplus because of their, uh, the farm bill mandating the USDA to do this. So the government has huge stores of milk. We have government cheese, we have that government milk, and to get rid of it, they partnered up secretly under this uh, dairy management brand with, for example, Domino's to create a seven cheese pizza. Okay? They also partnered with Taco Bell to make a steak and cheese quesadilla, Pizza Hut, and, and other fast food companies. So of course, this partnership with fast food and selling back the dangerous high fat milk to consumers through fast food most disproportionately harms the people who have the most fast food in their diets, right? And although white people eat the most fast food overall, people of color particularly in low income urban communities eat it as a higher percentage of their diet. Another example is what happened in the island of Kauai, in Hawaii. Here the city council voted five to one to put uh, for an ordinance, a pesticide ordinance, which would restrict pesticide use by the five major companies that are situated there and create buffer zones for schools, medical facilities, and residences. After that overwhelming vote in favor, the mayor, who was quite close with the agricultural companies, vetoed this bill the major companies situate there and cause a great amount of environmental and health damage. And the population of Kauai is mostly Native Hawaiian, Asian, Pacific Islander. More generally, the United States uh, USDA subsidies allow fast and processed food companies 
to sell their products at artificially low costs. Here you see the true cost of a Big Mac. The USDA creates, um, with the Department of Health and Human Services, the dietary guidelines, where the influence of the food industry is very strong. This is documented in Marion Nestle's work on food politics. And these guidelines serve as the, the basis for all of the federal food programs. Okay, so assistance to women and children and school lunches. Another thing that results from the industry and government partnerships is no restrictions on harmful food additives. Okay, so where other countries will prohibit things like potassium bromate, which is a chemical that decreases baking time, has been linked to kidney damage, cancer, and nervous system damage, is banned in Europe, Canada, and China, but here it is a common ingredient in package wraps, rolls, and flatbreads, okay, all found commonly in school lunches. Another additive, BHT, linked to tumors, cancers, banned in the United Kingdom, Japan, many European countries, but is in cereal and many packaged goods served to children. <coughs> So the undue influence of corporations over policy points to a need for structural reforms and stricter regulation to improve health outcomes generally and to provide equal access to healthy food. But instead, U.S. food policy focuses on transparency and behavioral economics. So the USDA funds a major research center at Cornell that studies how behavioral economics or nudging techniques can be introduced into school lunchrooms and other federal food programs to steer people towards healthier food choices. The other main government strategy to improve health has been through nutritional labeling. So chain restaurants, which is a restaurant <coughs> that owns 20 uh, franchises, are required to post their caloric content on menus and manufacturers have to display nutritional information such as sodium, fats, saturated fats, and sugar on labels. This is a little nod to Hawaii as well, but it's been. Okay. So the FDA has proposed changes to these labels. This is the current label, and this would be the new label. And many see this as a victory. But there are fundamental problems with these strategies. First, they rely on individuals having a true choice in their food selection and they don't actually work. So while everyone can agree that transparency is a good thing, it appears that people who use nutrition information are generally people who are already healthy. There are many reasons for transparency being ineffective. One is behavioral economics. People have trouble overcoming issues of self-control. They're more swayed by impulsivity and a food environment, such as colors, smells, positioning. They need more time to process new information than the few seconds they have looking up at a restaurant menu. Taste, price, and convenience are also more important to most people. And studies find that people will compensate for choosing healthy items by adding unhealthy ones. They also, a study showed that just seeing a healthy item on a menu satisfies the need for self-care and health, and the person will then choose an unhealthier selection after they've seen it. The food companies spend a lot of money perfecting recipes that combine salt, sugar, and fat to make food addictive, right? Unhealthy food addictive. They also research into how to get people to eat more once they're satiated. Okay. So all of these explanations are only relevant when the consumer has access to a range of food options. They're irrelevant if you have to buy your groceries from the corner store, eat the cafeteria lunches, and when you eat out, the only place you can go is a fast food place. In those cases, price and convenience are not just more important, they're determinative. So why the focus on transparency and behavioral economics to improve health? I would argue that it is precisely because these things don't work. They satisfy the demands of higher income and politically leveraged constituents while keeping the corporations happy. They come with a minimal cost 
and they don't impose any major structural reforms to the system. To engage in food policy that actually improves health and reduces health disparities, the government has to be separated from the industry. Some specific actions that could uh, take place that I would propose are of reducing subsidies. So corn subsidies support the sweetened beverage industry. That industry buys the corn that is grown by large agricultural operations that is not actually palatable for direct consumption. So a lot of corn that's grown right now, people just don't want to eat. But it goes into your sodas and your um, you know, rock star energy drinks, Gatorade, and that sort of thing. So these subsidies make soft drinks cheaper than juice or coconut water or something healthy, which then makes them enter into the diets of people who have less money to purchase them. Another area is in regulation and the trans fat uh, or partially hydrogenated oil controversy is, is a good example here. It took 15 years for the FDA to decide that what we found out in 1999 was responsible for 20,000 deaths a year should be classified uh, potentially as not safe, right? The initial reaction was a five-year labeling strategy, whereas most other countries that received this information immediately banned them from the shelves. And part of the way that trans fats uh, proponents argued against regulation was with the idea of the nanny state, right? Which is about personal choice. And racial stereotypes are used to support the idea that health is actually an issue of personal choice, right? So if a person is just too lazy or stupid to make the right health choices, right, if they're a welfare queen or an illegal Im immigrant, then those characteristics are responsible for health. This paradigm takes the focus off of structural reform and government responsibility and puts it onto individuals. So, uh, oh, that was a subsidy slide. I like to end with a happy slide. <laughs> so this is kind of uh, the ideal of what we would like to see. And I'll be happy to answer any more questions about these issues. Thank you, Andrea. Next we have Erin Harrison, who's a postdoctoral research fellow um, in the Department of Criminology at the University of Pennsylvania. So we're shifting gears a little bit from food to um, more traditional health related issues. Uh, she's going to be talking about, uh, or her presentation is called, Things Just Got Out of Hand, White Ownership of Victimhood and Race Based Medicalization of Addiction. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, that very nicely segues into my talk. So we're all set. Okay. Yes, thank you for the introduction, Margo. Uh, my name is Erin Harrison. I'm a postdoc in the Department of Criminology at UPenn. Um, and I'll just really briefly introduce sort of my broader work and, and how I landed on this topic and, and why I'm sharing it with you this afternoon. Um, I study punishment structures. I study prisoner reentry. I write a lot about recidivism and desistance, the process by which folks de-escalate either their substance abuse or offending patterns. Um, and I'm also really, really interested in legal consciousness, so the extent to which um, ideas, attitudes, beliefs, or interventions with law and legal institution, or the absence of, of that phenomena, um, impacts the reentry process, impacts recidivism, impacts desistance, right? So there's a ton of literature, sort of on the macro scale, um, about what's going on with, with laws and legal institutions and subsequent offending patterns, but less is said at the individual level. Um, so I had the good fortune of working with beautiful colleagues at the University of Delaware, uh, where I earned my PhD, and we were asking folks, um, drug involved folks, about their desistance efforts. Um, and I asked a lot of questions about sort of where you were when you made this choice, or when you didn't make this choice, you know, sort of thing. Um, and increasingly, sort of the law is everywhere thesis popped up, where people kept talking about how law and legal institutions um, played a significant role in their desistance efforts, either for better or for worse. Um, and often, for worse, unfortunately, was a burden um, born by folks of color. So that's what we're going to talk about today with respect to um, addiction especially, and who gets to claim even addictive status, right? I am addicted to something, I'm ill, versus a personal responsibility um, that Andrea very neatly <laughs> set me up for. 
All right, so let's rock. Can I? Here we go. Okay. Um, so actually, CRT is, is perfect for as a framework for talking about the war on drugs because it, I mean, it fundamentally establishes how law um, is, situates as well as perpetuates racial hierarchies. Right. So the war on drugs, we know um, hyper surveillance levels, or excuse me, at the neighborhood level. Um, mandatory minimum sentences, sentencing disparities between substance um, users is rampant, and this subordination continues through colorblind me mechanisms, excuse me, like the criminal justice system. In addition, folks who have served time, um, or I should say, or who were supervised under the criminal justice system, have to reconcile a, a barrage of exclusionary patterns um, codified in law that definitely limit their political and economic opportunities moving forward. I focus in my research um, on collateral consequences legislation, which is a body of law passed in the mid-90s. Um, Jeremy Travis refers to this as an invisible punishment in the second sentence. Um, and it's, it's the laws that are embedded within one's offender status, so laws that impact you after having been convicted um, in a host of different domains, employment, housing arenas, uh, access to education and funding for education, civil disenfranchisement, um, and increasingly legal fees and restitution as well. Um, as far as for a drug-involved population, seeking redemption, trying to mitigate sort of the collateral consequences and the exclusion that comes with, with that legislation that they live under, um, I ask questions of, of my colleagues and of the folks that I interview and, and ask them, how, how do you get back in, right? So, so when you're talking about citizenship and claims to citizenship and claims to rights as someone who has done their time, and, you know, has your certificate from whatever organization saying that they've gotten clean, um, they've redeemed themselves, how, how do you even get to a point where you can get that sort of documentation? Like what are sort of the hoops that you go through, bureaucratic hoops at that, to regain citizenship and say, listen, I'm ready to be back into the fold. Um, who is granted access to the opportunity to even jump through those bureaucratic hoops, right? Because my research, as you'll see in a moment, um, looks specifically at how folks are able to, is something wrong? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, you looked at me kind of funny, no worries. Um, usually my goggles improve the situation, but apparently not. Um, where am I? Yeah, how do folks gain access to sort of the, the legal interventions and institutional agencies that, that are the gatekeepers of such paperwork that says, yes, you are redeemed and you can get back in? Um, and sort of the fallout from this process or lack of access to that process. So Jonathan Simon talks a lot about idealized and demonized legal subjects, the folks um, for whom we give audience, you know, and say, listen, we're ready to hear you out. You can be redeemed. You can regain. And I, I have re in parentheses um, specifically because some folks were never integrated in the first place or were never seen as full citizens in my eye. Um, so asking folks, what steps did you take on the ground upon your release to regain or gain initially um, the citizenship that you so desperately seek and, and in my opinion deserve. All right? So the data set I'm using um, is called Roads Diverge, Long-Term Patterns of Relapse, Recidivism, and Desistance for a Cohort of Drug-Involved Offenders. Um, this research is made possible by the generous support of the National Institute of Justice. Thank you. Um, my colleagues and I collected these data to test, I think I have on the next slide. Perfect. Um, Ray Paternoster and Sean Bushway's identity theory of desistance, which asks, asks specifically, excuse me, um, about the mechanisms through which desistance unfolds for a contemporary drug-involved reentry cohort. Um, so really placing an emphasis on the idea that we have to seriously consider cognitive change, um, identity change, identity shifts as, as significant in the desistance effort, if not more so than sort of structural um, changes which is dominant in the life course criminological theory. That if you get married to someone who's pro-social, um, if you get a good job, not just a JLB, but like something where you can climb the ranks and build a career, military enlistment, et cetera. So that's pretty much the dominant paradigm in life course crim with respect to desistance that uh, Paternoster and Bush Bushway, excuse me, sought to challenge and the Rhodes data was used to sort of test that theory. So it unfolds in two phases, first of which is quantitative, um, we have official arrest and incarceration data on about 1,250 folks coming out of Delaware DOC in the mid-1990s. And from those data, we were able um, to build offending trajectory, um, group-based trajectory methods, excuse me, for the entire sample. 
For the second phase, it's qualitative. 304 folks were sampled from that larger population um, to ask or to, you know, to have a space where they could say in their own words more about the mechanisms through which they did or didn't arrive at desistance, um, you know, or relapse or continuing to offend, et cetera. So just very quickly, I'm going to talk about the qualitative stuff, but I still wanted to give you a snapshot of what was going on on the quantitative side. The majority of our sample, about three-fourths, was black, 80% male, a couple of statistics on the breakdown of race and gender, um, and the mean age was 45 and a half years old. The qualitative data were gleaned, or my analysis rather, is gleaned from roughly 90-minute in-depth interviews. They're semi-structured, so everyone on the team had a you know, survey instrument with sort of some bullet points that we needed to hit. For the most part, wherever the conversation took us is where it took us. Um, we used life calendars to establish where folks were from birth and childhood through their first arrest, through their first incarceration, um, as recently as when they were interviewed, which was between 2009 and 2011. Um, I use in vivo software package to code my transcripts and set up tree and parent notes to establish sort of thematic elements um, of, of representation of the desistance process, the reentry process, if you will, and I can, I can disaggregate that by a number of different sorts of uh, criteria, race, gender, the offending trajectory group, if you grew up somewhere rural versus urban, et cetera, it's really, really powerful software. Um, and what I'm interested in as sort of a DV is self-reported desistance, which for this group I define as not having committed any crime or used any drugs in the last 12 months. And you also could not have been under any supervision. So it doesn't count if you say, I didn't use anything, I didn't break any rules, but you were on probation. So completely unsupervised in an institutional sense and not having committed crimes or used drugs. So the, for the folks who were interviewed, about 300, um, those are the groups, those are the trajectory groups, which are not super important for this talk, but I still wanted to show that the folks who were sampled for the interviews is actually representative of the offending trajectories too. So we're getting a full picture in a qualitative sense for the larger sample of folks who fall within different sort of arrest um, and incarceration patterns. Uh, we oversampled for women because we wanted to learn more about their stories, specifically because the dominant life course, criminological paradigm, focuses on men. Um, majority black, almost two-thirds, and again, mean age of 45 years old. So what you should see here for this table, this is self-reported addiction and offending gleaned from the qualitative analyses. So the first column is percentage of folks interviewed who say that I have not used any drugs in the last 12 months. Second column, I haven't committed any crimes. Third, I immediately desisted. So this was the one and done kind of scared straight crew. Um, and then the end for the, for the subsample size. What I want to focus on today is for that first column, percentage of folks who have not used any substances um, in the last 12 months, you'll see there isn't very much difference between whites and blacks and men and women. Yet, what we see in, in arrest and incarceration records does not at all mimic these patterns. And we know this from the literature that there's, there's certainly overrepresentation um, increasingly of women and women of color at that um, round up in sort of this, this war on drugs. But I want to ask people, since you all are saying you're using or not using in sort of the same rates and frequencies, um, why are you landing in these groups? Thank you, Sophia. Like, why, why is it that um, you're saying you're not addicted any longer, but we, we have in this life calendar five, six, seven more different arrests, you know, especially technicals, which I'll talk more about if there's time. All right. So I use the parent code, blame for crime and drugs. There's, there's a number of parent codes, but for, for this paper, that's what I'm focusing on. And then the um, sort of tree branches are illness and disability, depression, and self. So the reason why I commit crimes or use drugs is because I'm hurt or disabled, um, because I am depressed, and I need to self-medicate, or I blame myself. There's, there's no reason beyond sort of my own personal choice um, or lack of foresight that would explain my persistent drug use. So men's and women's narratives are pretty much the same, particularly for onset. Um, onset of drug use, men and women in the sample attributed to friends, older siblings, cousins, like other kids in the neighborhood. Everyone else was doing it. I skipped homeroom and I was doing it too sort of thing. Women who started using later in life, so after sort of 30, 35 years old or our late onset subsample, um, they attribute a lot of their drug use from their partners, so boyfriends, husbands, et cetera. Um, men and women, sort of in equal measure, reported hyperactivity, anxiety, and depression as the reasons for why they started to use, and, and more importantly, for why they continue to use. Um, women especially talk a lot about escapist drug use linked to prior traumas and victimizations, um, and often limit their prescriptions um, 
due to their parenting responsibilities. Some people say, I can't take this drug, I'm, I'm a complete zombie, right? So there's that sort of difference between men and women um, with addiction and drug use. Black narratives look a little different from the white narratives, and I'll begin with them. When asked the question, and again, it's not that every single person was asked a question, I told you it's a semi-structured interview, we have a schedule, but for the most part this was posed, why did you continue to abuse substances? A lot of black folks, men and women alike, mentioned that they were hard-headed, you know, I had to do it my way, my way or no way, I was experimenting, I was bored, curious, you know, nobody held a gun to my head, these were choices that I made over the life course, I just wanted to rebel and lash out. Um, so when asked, you know, were you responsible or would you say you're responsible or who was responsible um, for your onset or continued drug use, folks would say things like this, almost definitely it was all on me, I'm 100% my worst enemy. Um, I was on Percocet taking 10 milligrams every few hours and I just, I just ran with it. You know, I should never have done that. I tried to get it fixed, but they weren't trying to hear it. So this is a really interesting thing that I saw with black respondents talking about how they recognize that as someone with a history of addiction, um, you know, prescriptions need to be monitored, right? And so they might say to their doctor, this is not gelling with me, I'm, I'm not strong enough or whatever to, to deal with this sort of prescription on my own and, and supervise myself. Um, and they didn't get the help that they needed, particularly from pain centers, of which there's a proliferation, thank you, um, in the area from which these folks were surveyed. White narratives look a little different in that very much a lot of the same sort of onset. I, I was defiant, I was rebellious, I'm with my friends, I just wanted to check it out. We were bored in eighth period, so we left and we tried these drugs. Um, but disproportionately, there was this element of illness, right? So I was sick and that's why I began, or more importantly, that's why I continue to use. So this particular uh, white woman um, had an early delivery of her child. She was using, she's in the methadone clinic, her child, she went into labor um, about five or six weeks earlier than she should have. So she says it was really difficult with the PTSD and getting off of the methadone and having the baby. I was in the hospital for a minute and then I was an outpatient for three months. So when she continued with her methadone use in the outpatient rehabilitate, rehabilitation center, excuse me, um, the heroin and methadone addiction was never addressed because she was sick from the PTSD, right? So first of all, there's a diagnosis. Someone says you have PTSD, it's on paper, that you are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Second, we're not addressing that in a way that's consistent with her needs as someone with a history of drug abuse um, and addiction, right? Another gentleman, white man, um, was legitimately hurt with some, you know, impaction, impaction, is that a word? Um, so he says he's hurting legit, um, but my dentist, he really hooked it up, so he knows he can go to the dentist to get his Percocet, you know, like, like you would anybody else um, just seeking treatment. But the sort of the, the issue is the dentist, not to call him out, is not being conscientious of his past history. All he sees is, is the, the, the impacted tooth, and I'm going to help you alleviate this pain, right? So they have a space for diagnosis and being seen as victims in a way that the black um, folks interviewed didn't talk about, right? And we'll ask why, why that is, right? So by and large, black men and women in this sample were blaming themselves, thank you, I'm like two, three slides away, thank you. Um, they're less seldom diagnosed and they're less likely to self-identify as addicted in this sample, right? So, so not only aren't the doctors necessarily recognizing their pain, and we've seen this, some, some recent studies are coming out with colorism and, and like kids getting hurt in school and who, who's really hurt or what's going on in the NFL with um, treatment for athletes of color, is it happening less frequently than it is for white athletes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so folks are not represent or recognizing, excuse me, the pain and victimization that, that blacks may feel, but more than that, blacks themselves have internalized sort of this individual responsibility rhetoric um, and not seeing themselves as addicted in sort of a, a, a medical, pharmacological sense, right? Um, so Crest is a treatment program that these folks were involved in, and when asked, did you go anywhere after that, they said, no, I stopped going. You can learn all this um, on your own. If you've got the willpower, you can stop on your own. You don't need a program. You just need to get your shit together, right? Whites blame their illness more, and this is an example where this one woman says, crack makes me relax. Interviewer goes, really? And she says, yeah, it makes me relax because of my bad back. Um, so it helps you with your pain and tension? Yeah, because right now I would die, um, I'm sorry, until right now today, I got back pain. Doctor can't do anything about it. I mean, they give me Percocets, but when the drug wears off, this pain persists. I don't see my doctor until next month. 
and he's going to give me a stronger medicine. I can't live like this, much like her male counterpart who knows he can go to the dentist to get the medicine he needs. So the question is, how do folks arrive at assistance? My original question is, how, like, sort of what are the steps and hoops you have to go through to reclaim citizenship um, after your sentence? Blacks talk uh, invariably about risk. Like, I can't live this life anymore. I'm going to die alone. I'm, I'm in incredible debt. My family's left me. I'm sick, etc. But not sick where I need a doctor. I'm sick where this pattern of choices is not working out anymore. Whites talk about treatment more so than blacks in that I was able to establish what was wrong with me all this time. Now I have the diagnosis, then I go into inpatient or outpatient and I'm armed with the tools that I need to, to do this reentry work in a productive way, right? So race matters, social capital matters. I had one gentleman who was in a union, his friends helped do a fundraiser to help him get the money he needed for the treatment. Um, and then SSI, your disability, can carry you through life, you know, which totally flies in the face of, of the welfare queen that you just mentioned, Andrea. So many of the white men in our sample are on disability and, and have been for years and plan to be for years. You can't get disability unless you've been diagnosed and kind of gone through these formal um, passes. So what I'm interested in is, is the idea, especially with legal consciousness, what folks say and how they think about themselves and, and where they're situated vis-a-vis -vis our respect, our recognition, visibility, claims to citizenship, it starts with them, right? So whether or not you'll even seek help begins with whether or not you deserve help or you recognize your situation as something that should be addressed in sort of a formal institutional matter. So we can't even have an intervention from a doctor until someone says, I need to see a doctor. This isn't something I should muscle through on my own. Um, and then also when you're, when you're on probation and parole supervision, sort of this treatment seeking work matters in your case file. Did you, did you make these efforts to do what you need to do to get clean? Well, if there's no paper trail saying that you've seen these doctors, psychiatrists, et cetera, um, you're kind of out of luck with your, with your supervising officer. And moving forward, I'm really interested to see how um, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act sort of helps folks gain access to these spaces where they can be diagnosed in a way that they hadn't been before, and how those diagnoses will matter for future um, recidivism and desistance work. Sorry, Sophia. Thank you. <laughs> bunch of time for questions, but I thought I would have the panelists move down here and maybe move some chairs into the front just so everyone can see each other. So I have a bunch of questions that I'll open up to the audience first. You all have the first chance to ask anything. And the panelists would like to ask each other questions. Michael? Or, 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 was, or is, it just a, is that just a waste of time? Um, We're just focusing on structure. 
I think um, what you're saying is really interesting, and, and it's a great way to be thinking about it. But I think the key to the problem is your use of the word persuasive, mm -hmm. right? Because labeling and information provision is all about educating and persuading, right? But that implies choice. Because you need to be in a position where you can make a different choice when you see and understand what's on the label. Right? And if the place you get your food is the corner store that only has, you know, I don't know, 30 different products and they're almost all unhealthy and full of those preservatives that kill you because they want to keep them on the shelf and they charge a, you know, what's called a ghetto tax for just living in that neighborhood where you could actually get it cheaper somewhere else but you can't get to the other place, right? Your food selection choices are not going to be about what's on the label. It's just completely irrelevant, right? So I like labeling. I use it constantly, right? But I'm exactly the kind of person that it's made for. Right? I'm health conscious. I can afford to go to Whole Foods and buy something else. If I don't like this, I can reject it, right? But until you address all those other structural things, then I don't think any of the things you're thinking about really could make an impact. There may be some middle ground for people you know, in a middle class who, yes, if they could just, you know, read the language, they would make a different choice. But I think that population is so small that it's not going to actually affect health disparities and health outcomes generally. Sadly.
jobs and, and they move out of uh, those communities, they become um, more aware of the limitations of social structure and of race, right? And so I, I, within that framework, it, it's kind of interesting to look at your findings because um, the men seem to be very aware of the social structure that's going on, these kind of risk structures that, that they're being encountered with, yet they still blame themselves. And I'm wondering within that, if, if you could talk about that a little bit, and then also within that, are they recognizing kind of a differentiated risk? Because we know that you know the law is differently applied on the books versus in action, right? So we might have uh, me versus a man of color who you know shoots up heroin, and my parole agent finds out about it, and I get offered treatment, and the black man gets automatically a technical violation and is sent back to the penitentiary. So how much is that part of the individual blame and awareness and that kind of stuff? Sure, that was a great question. Um, the first thing, the, the Rhodes data set, it's, it's a randomized control experiment um, in Delaware DOC where about 1,200 people <laughs> um, were in a therapeutic community, which is where you're out of population in corrections, and it's wraparound services um, with, a, with a heavy, heavy emphasis on treatment and rehabilitation. And then you would look at sort of institutional measures with, with safety and cooperation and inmate to guard, sort of interfacing what, what, what that looks like, and, and then recidivism, of course, outside, um, compared against control group who is not in TC. So TC, the TCRS program, um, is, is a glorified boot camp, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a ton of, of rugged individualism is the rhetoric that animates that space. Um, Answering to authority, you know, if you do anything wrong, like rice gets dumped out on the ground, you need to pick up each grain, you know, like very, very, I mean, the minutia, like the things that folks have to do on a day to day basis, um, I would argue have very little to do with, with sort of a cognitive based theory, uh, cognitive based therapy agenda was, was premised upon, and more so about breaking folks down and not even building them back up. So everyone that we spoke to was part of TC, those, those 1250 folks. Um, so, so they're coming, they're brokering all these relationships into the reentry experience with, with that framework, right? That, that five, six, seven years, depending on how long they were doing it. Because again, folks do it for good time, not, not actually for rehabilitation, right? So they get the certificate, they come out, but they still have the, have the language. Um, and I wish you could see, well, you can, it's on ICPSR. So all the transcripts, um, people use the language, people, places, and things. Like, like how you hear AA speak, and NA speak, well, there's Crest speak too. Um, so to answer you, despite sort of sort of Al Young's thesis that once you're exposed in the world, you'll you'll see it's not your fault. You know there are these other sort of powers that be um, that shape and constrain your movement. They have embedded in them this this crest language, which is you 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 you, you are the author of your past, present, and future. Um, so to answer you, I would imagine that some of that's got to be responsible for why this persistent self blame narrative. Um, is seen here with these data, and then what's your second one? So do they, do they also within that recognize this differentiated risk based on race, right? Oh, yeah. Where, you know, yeah. two drops, two very drops, yeah. different outcomes. Yeah. Right? Well, that's a really interesting thing, too. Like, 15 minutes just goes, Sophia. Um, folks who, first of all, get the, so they recognize their, their illness and then go to doctor and they get the diagnosis, and then they have their prescription treatment, right? So that's, the script is written for that. You can't give a clean urine when you, like, your bloodstream is right for the purpose or whatever else you're on, right? So then you get your note from your doctor saying, so-and-so is exempt, you know, or, or don't, don't violate them for this dirty urine because, because that's a script that I gave them for, for the impact of these things or whatever. Right. So there's those protections too that folks, black folks, are seeing their white counterparts get. Because uh, I mentioned this, this is all in like Wilmington, Delaware, which is this big, right? So everyone kind of knows how folks are moving in and out of, of the reentry process, the reentry effort. And black person number one sees white person number one with, with their doctor's note, like like a real doctor's note that you would ask a student for if they missed class, saying it's totally cool if I have a dirty urine because I have this prescription. So there is that risk too, even even with your um, there's no parole in Delaware, probation supervisor, your probation officer, where you know if you get in urine, you're going to get violated. You know, you don't have that note. Um, 
And it's, and it's terrible because everyone is abusing these drugs. Some people are legitimately sick, sure, but you know, they're, they're, they have high dosages, they're taking them at high frequencies, um, and they take them for longer than they're actually in pain. So everyone is kind of doing the same thing, but it's, it's that doctor's note, it's that bureaucratic little piece of paper that um, lets you claim victim, <laughs> victim status. I'm not responsible for this dirty year. It's attributed to my illness. Does that answer you? Mm -hmm. Um, I really enjoyed these presentations, and you know, um, I have a couple comments and then I'll point some questions. Um, first, you know, Ernesto, I really enjoyed your assertion that local context of our food represent the larger socio-legal context. Um, I'm at the beginning of my own research in food justice issues, and I just found it a really helpful assertion, and I would invite you to talk about sort of um, the theoretical basis for the other scholars who have either um, demonstrated those claims very persuasively or you know, just uh, sort of accord with your assertion or your intuition on that. Um, Andrea, I think I want to pick up a little bit on the question that was posed to you a little earlier, um, because similarly, I don't, I don't know the demography of obesity and overweight adequately. I mean, I have a general sense of, of minors versus adults, but I want to ask you, if you can, to tell us now or later, um, what the different income quintiles show as to overweight and obesity. Um, because I was I was really intrigued by the suggestion that you know greater English literacy and sort of other um, indicia of formal education might mitigate what you're saying as the lack of the ability to make the choice, say for people in the middle quintile or in the second. Um, you know, people who are near poor. Um, and then I guess I'd also want to do it by education, I realize. I would want to see, you know, does higher years of formal education make us less likely to be able to our needs? Um, with, with the premise, I guess, that more education would give people more possibility of being able to I don't know if that's actually a sound premise. Um, and then I was really uh, pleased, you know, Erin, for your presentation that you mentioned the SSI and SSDI part because um, I guess of welfare reform. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that that, um, I don't know how well you develop that, the access to SSDI or SSI, but to me that's a really interesting legal one that maybe could you know, go to a whole different research project. Thank you. Do you want to know Something very local. So when people in Asia, which is you know one of the main reasons 
um, soy sriracha is growing so much because it's, it's getting a lot of following in Asia and in Europe. They need that local part. But then on the flip side, the power is completely local. The city is complaining. The residents are complaining because this is our neighborhood and we have this power. And you know, and so if, if there's a theory, it, it definitely has to do with like you know the scalar level of power. And here, you know, maybe the since the national government or the California government could have influenced Irwindale better. But the reality is that those laws are on the book. They have the ability, as long as they have the money and a judge doesn't stop them, they have the, they have the ability to pursue as much litigation as they want. And so I, if I had to theorize, it would be like, you know, where jurisdictions really come into play with, like, you know, power to stop or do something. Thanks for your comments. Um, uh, really interesting to think about education income and obesity and of course race is a really big factor in obesity diagnosing as well. And I would think that it's not really about education in the sense that I am better educated therefore I can better understand what labels mean. Right? I think that education as it correlates with higher income is what's important because that's about how much choice you have. right? And if you really want to reach people, I don't think those labels are particularly informative for anyone, right? I think very few people will look at a label and parse this part and that part. Uh, possibly warnings like the types we have on cigarettes, right? especially in Canada where it has to take up half the cigarette package and you know, <laughs> it can say, this will kill you, right? I mean, a picture to me. Yeah. <laughs> I guess like lungs. Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I would love to see that on, uh, you know, Gatorade, right? There's this chemical that makes color stick to water that just basically will kill you if you drink enough, right? And this is what everybody is drinking, right? So uh, I think that's, it's not about education, right? It's not about what you can understand. It, this is a, a matter where I believe the government has to step in. It is just like a traffic light. I mean, this is something that will persist unless it's regulated against because people make money off of it. And the government makes money off of these food corporations who then are able to influence that we don't have those kind of labels. Right? So that's why I think any personal attribute like education and you know an income and race is not the relevant place to be looking, right? Mm -hmm. The place to be looking at is why isn't this being regulated, right? And how can we get it regulated? Um, I want to. I want to start by saying I would never, for one second, dismiss the reentry experiences of any of the folks in my group. So everybody, no matter what sort of intersectional framework you lie at, you know, everybody's hurting. There's nothing fun about a conviction record, right? It's just the women of color occupying the lowest sort of rungs of the ladder. Um, but everyone's having trouble with illness, especially if you're drug involved. Tons of folks um, report like renal failure, kidney issues, um, liver issues, excuse me, um, um, abscesses that didn't heal from, from intravenous use, you know, so everybody's struggling with their health, right? But what's important about SSI, which is such an important point that you raised, um, is that most of the folks who get SSI, or I'd say all of them, um, they're diagnosed with some sort of disability, but it's often work-related, right? So it began with a workman's comp suit, and they were able to show, I got hurt on the job. Well, the folks who are getting hurt on the job are white men in the manufacturing days that still have access to the unions and the docks in when we can go, right? So everyone can get hurt at work, but you have to have um, formal employment to get workman's cop. So you can be cleaning someone's house and hurt yourself, but that's, that's a cash gig, you know? So, so folks, um, especially women of color who are doing that kind of work, um, they, don't, they don't get that, right? So that's the first piece of paperwork that they don't have access to. Um, and then secondly, with, with sort of the, the health diagnosis, you know, I'll reiterate, if, if you don't see yourself as ill enough to need a doctor or you can't afford a doctor or you know a doctor's gonna put you on medication that completely slows you down, which is often what it is, it's not 
aimed at treatment is said, you know, for these people who are reporting hyperactivity and anxiety. Um, you you will instead go on with your life, right? So you'll say this this is the lesser of the two evils. So a lot of folks are not even approaching the subject of pursuing disability claims. Um, and then if you look again at, at sort of the violating practices of the technical violations that um, folks are getting or not getting, and that being linked to whatever little piece of paper you have or don't have, um, then it does become a serious legal issue with supervision. So are we are we really getting at folks who are offending? Um, and abusing drugs, or are we just continuing this paper trail and perpetuating the footage that comes with either getting working with common disability because you were in the formal labor market, or you know, you've adopted sort of a, an ideology where you see yourself as a victim or someone who merits care and attention in a way that other folks do not. So yeah, I'm, I'm debating on having the SSI piece um, as sort of the second half of this, or hopefully placing this somewhere and citing it in, in a subsequent piece talking about SSI. But no, it's a great question. Thank you. I, I, I have a question. Maybe both of you want to attack it. Just thinking, I'm trying to take my crit race hat off and go back into being like a regular old law professor. Um, so if we're talking about choice being a problem for food or, or, or for seeking access to some type of health care, can, can we think of this how contract law or how tort law solves these type of problems? Because, or at least how to analyze why our legal systems make sense of this? Because at a certain point, whether it's unconscionability or some type of other, you know, fraud-based norm in contract law, you would, okay, what's the substance? What's the procedure? How wrong is this? Is there is this a better way to make sense of why food is oppressive as opposed to just putting the labels in a different format or putting the labels in? in like a color scheme, in other words, is there another way to, 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 to make sense of why this could be wrong? Or in torts, which I'm assuming is okay, there's a duty created because we know this is wrong. We know creating this coffee pot will explode. And it's a consumer choice to buy that coffee pot or not, but we could organize it in a different way. Is there, is there, is there because I'm kind of assuming the way we're arguing it right now on this panel is let's just come up with a better regulatory method, but maybe there's another, law could deal with this in another way. So this, this is what I'm Make, I know you've written a contract. So. Yeah, and, uh, but I think you would need a huge paradigm shift around eating in the United States, right? Because that is kind of the last bastion of this is all about a personal choice, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want the government in my, you know, breakfast table, yeah. right? So in order to make it and frame it that way into something you could bring into court yeah. and litigate, Right? You would have to fundamentally transform the way that people think about eating. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like any big social movement. You would need, along with legal reform, mm -hmm. a massive social movement to see food as politics and political. Although, in some ways, going in the towards contract direction is mm -hmm. still relying on a fundamental structure of individual rights and individual relationships with with products and with corporations. So in some ways it actually wouldn't be a really fundamental shift. That, that's what I thought. Like this, those are the questions we ask in contract law court law. You made the choice to step on that, you know, on, on that hose or you made the choice to get that debt. Yeah, but it's how do you define sort of functionality, right? So, so we may we have that principle, but it's rarely applied. Right? And so to apply it in the food that's where the the greater shift in thought comes, right? Because for a court to view it as something that's functional, you would need that whole sort of thing. So uh, I also have another question about the, the personal responsibility issue. So I'm just you know, baseline, very sympathetic to the idea that in, in lots of areas of the law we rely way too much on personal responsibility where there are structural issues that get in the way of people actually being able to exercise it in the ways that they want to. But just to, to push back on it for a second, is there still a role for personal responsibility? And, and if there is, how do we begin to think about line drawing and figuring out how much, how much we want to rely on personal responsibility and how much we want to push for more kinds of structural changes? I think the institutions need to recognize where individual responsibility is not appropriate, like to assign that is not appropriate. So, so for either probation or parole, um, 
healthcare provision agencies, we have treatment centers. Um, it's fine if, if people, well it's not fine, but I understand why they espouse the individual responsibility um, rhetoric, particularly as, as Crest graduates, if you will, being part of that TC community. Um, but then the doctor needs to say, no, you're actually sick, right? So, so, so the, the, cause we do that all the time. Like how many times have you not been well? <laughs> and then someone who knows better than you says, no, you're sick, you know? So I feel like, so the, the folks who, especially if they're the gatekeepers to, to freedom and citizenship and redemption, if they would be more proactive uh, systematically in making sure folks who are victims or folks who are unwell or folks who deserve treatment, and I would argue everyone who is ill deserves treatment <laughs> regardless of their conviction record, um, we can start to move forward with, with providing health care and getting people the documentation, documentation excuse me, that they need um, for a society, disability, or whatever sort of those privileges come with being ill. I don't want to cast it that way. But, um, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's happening in the institutional level. There's an absence of, of empathic behavior and, and recognition of visibility for folks with records. And it gets worse and worse um, along the gender line and along the racial line. You see those hierarchies really playing out. I think the line is pretty clear that personal responsibility comes in where you can actually exercise. So once you deconstruct and dismantle all of the structural factors, right, which include you know, targeted marketing to certain mm -hmm. populations, right, all the media influence, the, the school cafeterias, everything that's about your daily life and where you live and what you have access to, and you strip it all down, and then you're standing there and you can pick the big bang or you know the rising levels. That's your personal But well, we're so far away from that. Yeah. It, it, it seems to me that we're Two parts. One is that piece where you actually have to have a choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece that strikes me is that you still have to have information that's accurate, truthful, sufficient. Um, and otherwise, you know, it's really hard to meet a certain threshold when you even get to the question of who's responsible. Yeah. But information is also something, that, I mean, it's so connected to the idea of that true cost, right, and all the externalities. Because some of the information would be very simple. Like if a Big Mac, Big Mac actually cost $12, and you know, the lentils and rice cost $2, mm -hmm. and reflecting, then the choices would still be determined by the factors, but they'd be simpler. Okay. Yeah, there's a continuum. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you never get to a perfect, right. <laughs> a perfect piece, but more it seems to be the better off you are. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that.
to mean to an upper market that was, if you had just coins, you could afford to buy loose rice, dried beans, vegetables brought in that day from the farm outside yes. of the capital. And the they were like, oh, this is so boring. Let's take you to the brand new Exito, this huge supermarket chain that mimics American grocery stores. And this whole process, in these food zones, there is a true price cost. To buy food that comes from the farm, very expensive. To buy these import, mostly imported goods was very expensive. The true cost really is there. And in the United States, all of that is just obliterated, what we see is. It's how, how are you buying soda at this tiny price and you can not afford a $3 bottle of coconut water? Yeah. And, and that's also why you see the decline in immigrant health, right? When so many people move to the United States, and those items like eating in McDonald's is a status item. It is a status item. Right. So, and so then health deteriorates. We are out of time, unfortunately, but thank you all so much for coming, and thank you to the panelists.